So, week three of Advent. I know this because there are three candles lit before me. We have reflected on hope. We've reflected on what we have in Christ at this time. This time between his promises and the now and the not yet of our Christian hope. We live with the blessing of the Holy Spirit. The forgiveness that Christ offers those who believe. And the assurance that he will come again. We reflected on peace, the peace that we have in Christ that is here and now. And it's Christian peace that's available to us in the messiness of real life, in the struggle and the strife that we face. Even in those kinds of difficulties, we have peace of Christ guiding us through those challenges. It is, it is one of the most wonderful blessings, I think. Today we're talking about Christian joy. Our scripture passage comes from Matthew's gospel. Now, our Christian tradition holds that Matthew was, was the disciple that's written about by the name of Levi. It's believed he was a tax collector, and he was one of the disciples. But this work is anonymous, so it's not known for certain if he is the author. In recent Centuries have brought discussion about that, but I like Christian tradition, so I'm going to refer to it as the Gospel of Matthew and think of it as being written by one of God's disciples. The Gospel of Matthew was brought a lot of new information to Christians. It's written from Mark, we know that, but there's a lot more to it than just what's in Matthew and Mark. Okay. Do what? The FM broadcast is not going through. So, Charlene, what I need you to do is there's a, at the top of the board, above, the very top of the board is where the plugs are, Mm Melissa. You're going to unplug the one that goes to the FM transmitter. So it's, it's, uh, nope. Here, actually, so you have to excuse me, folks. Just forgive me for a moment. It's back on. It's back on. <laughs> Praise God. Okay. Wonderful job, Charlie. Thank you. So Matthew's gospel was written off of off of Mark's gospel, but it's a lot different than Mark. And on the on the common points where Matthew and Mark have covered the same material. It's not that Matthew has said more about those same things, and that's why his gospel is bigger. Actually, if you look at it closely, where Matthew and Mark have covered the same material, Matthew actually says less about the things that Mark has covered, which is hard to believe because Mark's gospel is really brief. But it's true. Matthew takes what Mark had written and fills in Blanks in other areas. He brings in a whole bunch of new stuff. And his his purpose of writing seems to be for both Greek and Jew. And it seems to try to present a fuller picture of the blessings of the kingdom of God that we can tap into. It wants to paint Christ very clearly as the Messiah, the one whom God had said he would send. And to remind remind us that our Christian faith has with it a call to action. See, Matthew wants us to know that when we embrace Christ, there's all kinds of blessings that come our way, but there's also things that, that we'll be motivated to do in this. Matthew is a guidebook to Christian living with a focus on helping us See the grace of God, God's inclusiveness in being available to all, and knowing that there is something about this that should motivate us. That's why we're called to go and make disciples, to teach all that he taught. So it's a book that wants us to see our Christian faith as impacting us and impacting others. Our scripture today comes from Matthew, 
chapter two, chapter two, verses one through twelve. And it is the Magi. Visitors from the east. Jesus was born. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from the eastern land arrived in Jerusalem asking, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose. We've come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law and asked, Where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem, in Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah. For a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men. And he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. Then he told them, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And you will find him. Come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. After this interview, the wise men went their way. And the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and they saw the child with his mother Mary. And they bowed down and worshipped him. And they opened the treasure chest and gave him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. When it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. And God bless this reading of the word today. So, on the theme of joy, our wise men were filled with joy when they saw the star for the second. At that time, they were able to follow the star and were led directly to the home where Christ was to be found. But why joy? Why do we get joy from that? I want to look at what we know about this story to try and understand the reasons that these men may have been filled with joy. Why not happiness? You see, there's a difference. To sum it up simply, I'd say happiness is a feeling, and joy is a state of being. There's often happiness in many homes at Christmas on the morning when the gifts are open, but I suspect that the feeling will fade when people once again feel as they did before. I truly believe that people deep down know that having stuff isn't the answer. Stuff can't fill the void that we have in our lives. But every year we run out and buy more stuff. We give more stuff. We receive more stuff. But we long for more. I think our longing could be described as a desire for the comfort of deeper cosmic understanding. The comfort of being known and in knowing. It is and our appreciation for the presence of God that I think we long for. For Him knowing us and us knowing Him. Happiness is a feeling that comes and goes. Joy has something about it that makes it lasting and enduring. Biblically and by definition, joy is quite different from happiness. It has deeper roots. It has more impact and more reward. It is bigger. It is broader. So much so that joy can exist right alongside of sadness and struggle. We can have joy at the same time as we face real life. Sickness. Death. Financial troubles. Marriage troubles. All of those things while we still carry with us joy. Happiness cannot. Happiness cannot make it through the struggles of real life. 
So why did the wise men receive joy upon seeing the star and not just happiness? Well, first we know that these guys, they came to the, the knowledge about the star through diligent study. They are called wise men. They're magi from the east. They're, they're people who, who looked to the stars for knowledge. So they had, through diligent study, gleaned from the stars the birth of a king. And they gathered their gifts suitable for a king, and they set off to pay tribute to this child that would be king. When they reached Jerusalem, the seat of power in Israel, the place where the palace of the king is to be found, no one in power, no one in authority, no one who should know about the birth of a king knows that this happened. They know where it's supposed to happen, but they don't know that it has happened. They knew the prophecy, but they didn't know the reality. That was new information for these magi, these wise men. These wise men with that new knowledge, could have decided that since no one in power knew about the birth of this child, maybe the reading of that star might have been wrong. They could have questioned what they thought they knew. Or they could have figured that they read the star correctly and, and maybe this child might be a king of some sort. He might be significant in some way, but if no one in power really knows who he is and that he has been born, if they are the only ones that know he's been born, how could it really matter? How significant could it really be? They could have questioned their trip, their journey. They could have said to one another, what's the point? If no one in authority knows about this king, is he really king? What's the point of paying tribute to a king that has no power? And with that, they could have turned and headed home. But these guys, they, they didn't do that. You see, these were wise men. They didn't turn around. They didn't second guess what they once believed. They stuck to it. They trusted and believed that their research, their learning, had truth to it. And they chased after that baby born king. Through diligent study, these men had stumbled onto something that I think they believed was truly special. They could have turned around, but they didn't. They persevered. And upon resuming their journey, the star that had appeared before them once before led them to Jerusalem. It settled over the home where Jesus was, and that's when they were filled with joy. Their joy was in finding Jesus. When they saw the star once more, they knew that this time it was different. This time, it took them to Jesus. The first time, it just told them of the birth of a child. It didn't really do much to guide them at that point. Their joy was in coming into the presence of the Messiah, not in the presence that they carried for the Messiah. It was in knowing that they were about to be in a room with Christ, that was the source of their joy. They knew that the destination of their journey was just ahead. They knew that the stars in heaven had played a part. These guys were used to looking at stars. They're used to watching them and seeing them, but I bet they've never been led to a home by a star before. The star was providing them more than just information. It was giving them guidance. It was like a GPS for them. Now these guys, they, they used maps, they knew maps. They could get information from them. And that's the thing about maps, really. There's, there's a lot of information there, but you have to know how to get it. But this star didn't require any special knowledge. All they needed to know was recognize it, and it led them to where they needed to go. So when I was when I was driving a truck back in the 90s, it was a time before GPS. And before you set off on a trip, I used to do long haul in Canada and the US. Some of my trips were 
were to the same place. I, I had a, a meat run that I loved that went down the east coast of the US and I went to the same place when I did that meat run. But, but often, that meat run was one that if I didn't get back in time, I didn't get to go on again. So it would depend on, on my return trip whether or not I got to do that run. So I would be sent down to different places quite often. And when you went to some place different, you had to spend some time doing your research. You had to pour over the maps. You had to know the places where you were going. You had to know the, the route was going to be the safe route for you. You had to know the bridges were heavy enough for your rig. You had to know the overpasses were high enough that you could get under. You had to be diligent and read the map. I remember the first time Charlene and I were in Florida with the kids one time. This was long after I drove a truck. We were in Florida with the kids and we had a rental car and we had a GPS and we had John Cleese, of all people, giving us directions. And it was unnerving to me because I hadn't sat down and poured over the maps. I hadn't looked at the route. I hadn't looked at the interchanges. I didn't know how far we needed to go before we made the next turn. I was, I was nervous about it, and I didn't trust John Cleese. He, he has a nice voice, but I didn't trust him. And it was unnerving to me to just have him tell me to turn right in 500 meters. Well, which lane was the right lane? You know, you're on a four-lane highway. Are there two lanes that go right, or are there, is there just one? If I can't get over to the just one lane, is being in the second lane going to be good enough? I hadn't looked at the maps. I hadn't done my research, and I was unnerved. <clears throat> These guys were used to looking at maps. These guys were used to doing diligent study. But that day was different for them than my first experience with the GPS. See, they recognized that star. There was something about it that made them comfortable with it. And it settled over top of the place where Jesus was, and they knew, they knew that they were going to be in the presence of someone divinely special. The star had told them where to go, like a map can do. A map can tell you how to get there, but it doesn't tell you where to go. You still need to figure it out. You can get to the right area, you can get to the right road, but you don't know what the address might be. You can't see on the map that the church is on the corner, maybe. You might know that generally it's here, but it's hard to know specifically if it is. But if there were a star sitting right over top of the building, it identifies us a lot more clearly. Those men found their joy in knowing that the star marked the place where they were going to be in the presence of someone divinely special. Divinely special. Led to by the star. Their joy was in the awareness that they were about to enter into the presence of Christ. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and heaven and nature sing. That night, nature sang. The star shone over the house where the Christ child was. And it brought joy to the wise men to know that they had been led divinely to the presence of King. Joy is a satisfaction that is lasting and will not be wiped away. Those men had a memory given to them that they would not soon forget. That was a source of their joy.
coming into the presence of Jesus. Joy is not a delicate flame. It's not something that can be blown out in the first sign of trouble. It's more like an ember. It's more like something that, that endures and carries on. Our joy has the power it does because we understand that, that here and now, in the not yetedness of the fullness of Christ's salvation, we know Him. We can be in His presence. It's important for us to not forget that our Christian joy is in the fullness of Jesus. In him as a child born, in his life and his ministry, in his death and in his resi resi my goodness, resurrection. This is the fullness of knowing Jesus. But there's also a knowing Jesus that, that impacts us in our lives today. There's a sending of the Holy Spirit that we have, but there's also this knowing of Jesus that we can have. Paul writes about it in 2 Corinthians. Corinthians. He says, examine yourself to see if your faith is genuine. Test yourselves. Surely you know that Jesus Christ is among you. There's presence of Christ among us today. We've been led to it divinely. We've been called. We've been brought together as his church. And that is a source for joy. It is the anchor for the greatest joy there is, I believe. Holy Spirit points us to Christ, but Christ is here among us today, helping us, leading us, guiding us. Holy Spirit helps us to see His victory over sin, including ours. And points us to having a relationship with Christ as a way to overcoming those things. Because Christ overcame. So this Christmas, may you examine yourselves to see that your faith is genuine. Test yourselves and know that Jesus Christ is among you. And may that bring you peace. May that bring you hope. And may that fill you with joy. And with that joy, may it overflow and impact our community deeply. May it help others to want to know this for themselves. Because joy is not in the presence that we get at Christmas. It is the presence that we have with Christ among us. May the grace of the Lord Jesus the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now.